Welcome and good morning. Before we begin our program, we would like to acknowledge that UBC's campuses at Point Grave, Robson Square and in the Okanagan are situated on the traditional unceded territories of the Musqueam, Squamish and tsleil peoples and also in the territory of the Silix Okanagan Nation. We would also like to acknowledge that you've joined us from many places near and far and acknowledge the traditional owners and caretakers of those lands. My name is Jennifer Mackey. I am a second year PhD student in the Interdisciplinary Studies Program here at UBC. I am a member of the Nakazli First Nation, which is a part of the Carrier Nation located in Northern BC. It is my pleasure to welcome each of you to today's program in which our featured speaker, Justice Edwin Cameron, will deliver his talk, Prisons and the F Word, Has the Time Come for a Fundamental Rethink? Following the presentation, Justice Cameron will join Dean Benedet, Professors Deborah Parks and Efra Arbel from the Peter A. Allard School of Law for a conversation and a short Q&A with the audience. We are thrilled to have over 500 participants joining us live this morning. Thank you all for attending. For the Q&A portion of the event, we will be using the online audience engagement tool Slido. To access this, please go to slido.com and insert the code UBC Connects, all one word, to begin. You may begin to submit your questions at any, uh, any time and are encouraged to submit questions throughout Justice Cameron's presentation. It is also open to you to submit your votes on all questions submitted by other participants. It is now my pleasure as MC to introduce some greetings from our President and Vice Chancellor of the University of British Columbia, Santa J. Ono. Santa J. Ono is the 15th President and Vice Chancellor of the University of British Columbia he earned his BA in Biological Science at the University of Chicago and his PhD in Experimental Medicine at McGill University. Before joining us at UBC, Professor Ono held a variety of teaching, research, and administrative positions, the Johns Hopkins School of Medicine, Harvard Medical School, University College London, Emory University, and finally at the University of Cincinnati, where he served as president starting in 2012. And now I will pass the floor over to President Ono, who will introduce our very special guests. Thank you, Jennifer, and welcome everyone to UBC Connects. UBC Connects is a public lecture series that features esteemed thought leaders and focuses on pressing global issues. Before we begin, I'd like to recognize and thank the R&J Stern Family Foundation for their generous support of the series our colleagues at Alumni UBC for their support, and the Georgia Strait, our media partner for this event. Since the UBC Connect series began two years ago, we've had many distinguished and fascinating speakers from around the world, including Isabel Allende, Michael Pollan, Jeremy Rifkin, Dr. Vandana Shiva, and Nobel Prize winner, Donna Strickland. Today's speaker, Justice Edwin Cameron, will be no exception. Edwin Cameron retired from judicial service in August 2019 after 25 years as a judge, the last 11 in South Africa's highest court, the Constitutional Court. Before that, he served in the Supreme Court of Appeals for eight years and the High Court for six. He was educated at Pretoria's Boys High School, Stellenbosch, and as a Rhodes Scholar at Oxford. During apartheid, he was a human rights lawyer. He has fought for LGBTQ2 equality and was a fierce critic of President Mbeki's age denialist policies. He has written two prize-winning memoirs, Witness to AIDS and Justice, a personal account. He holds honorary degrees from six universities. Since retiring from the bench, he has been selected chancellor of Stellenbosch University and appointed Judicial Inspector of Correctional Services. We are deeply honored to have him join us today. Today's talk by Justice Cameron is being presented in partnership with the Peter A. Allard School of Law in celebration of the school's 75th anniversary. I would like to thank the participants in today's event. Panelists, Professor Deborah Parks and Associate Professor Efrat Arbel. Dean Pro Tem, Janine Benedet, who will moderate the event, and Senator Kim Pate 
who will provide opening remarks. And now it's my pleasure to hand things over to Jadine Benedet. Thank you, uh, President Ono, for uh, those remarks. And it's now my pleasure uh, as the moderator to uh, introduce our opening uh, remarks from Senator Kim Pate. Senator Pate was named to the Senate of Canada in 2016, but uh, prior to her appointment for nearly um, 40 years, she has worked tirelessly on behalf of some of the most marginalized groups in Canadian society, and in particular as an advocate for those who are incarcerated with a special focus on women and youth. She is credited as a driving force behind the inquiry into certain events at the Prison for Women in Kingston, and the self-defense review of convictions and sentences of women using lethal force to defend themselves against their abusers. She's a graduate of Dalhousie uh, Law School uh, and has continued her work uh, in her time in the Senate um, and has done more to really to raise awareness on behalf of legislators across Canada about the need of conditions in Canada's prisons than really anyone um, uh, we could name. For many years, she was the executive director of the Canadian Association of Elizabeth Fry Societies, starting in 1992 until her appointment in 2016. Uh, and she is also a member of the Order of Canada. And so we're just so delighted that she could take some time out of her very busy schedule to deliver a remark to us today. So I'll turn it now to Senator Pate. Thank you very much, Dean Benedet and uh, President and Vice Chancellor Ono and uh, Justice Cameron and Professors Parks and uh, Arbel and uh, special to future Dr. Uh, Jen Mackey because uh, it's a fantastic privilege and honor to be part of this. And thank you for all the work you do, all, all of them, particularly all of the contributions that the Allard School of Law makes. I come to you from the unceded, unsurrendered territory of the Algonquin Anishinaabek. I'm actually just in an anteroom off the Senate because I'm doing second reading of um, one of our bills, the bill to try and have convictions expire. And then I've got some questions for the government and the like. So I do apologize that I'm starting off now, and I'm, but I will be tuning in through uh, thanks to technology. I was so excited to hear that uh, Justice Cameron would be uh, presenting this uh, this Connects lecture because the, the convergence right now, the vital convergence of the importance of looking at how this pandemic has revealed very clearly uh, the intersections as well as the massive chasms between our economic, our social and our health so-called safety nets, not just in this country, but globally, uh, as well as the interconnection between uh, Black Lives Matter, the uh, the role and um, exacerbation of inequalities that the police and corrections pose to the incredible uh, racism, sexism, uh, the ableism, class bias that exists in our country, and again globally, is is really right now the time that we need to be taking on these issues, not to mention the incredible uh, issues we have. And one of the other um, things I'm speaking about today is the, the lack of supports for poor people and for people who are living on the edge, uh, working poor and, and the like. And we, again, we've seen exposed how little we have privileged people and the climate and the world, the environment in um, in recent years and how important it is for us to open up these issues. And in that context, look at, in a very critical way, what role prisons and policing have in terms of, of continuing the discrimination, creating amplifiers for that discrimination and sinking more and more people into a situation where it is very difficult for them to ever extricate, be extricated from those situations. In Canada, we've had the Truth and Reconciliation Commission, the Missing and Murdered Indigenous Women Inquiry. We've had um, numerous pieces of legislation, most recently dealing with prisons, a bill called Bill C-83 that was supposed to eliminate segregation 
uh, and, or solitary confinement and replace it with structured intervention units. We've had numerous reports just in the past week alone about how those systems have failed. And as we're having this discussion today, uh, of the women that I have spent the last 25, 30 years focusing on, 44% of those women in custody are Indigenous, 10% are Black, and the majority of them have dealt with past trauma and are dealing with the impact of trying to navigate uh, in inhospitable communities as poor women, as racialized women, as women who have experienced past trauma and have been offered very little. Um, during the time in the Senate, some of you are aware about 30 of my colleagues have joined us to go to prisons and actually document. So I'm very excited about the work that Justice Cameron is doing in terms of the inspection of prisons and inspection of so-called correctional facilities. Some of you know I started out my work in this area very much committed to prison reform. And it was as we saw the inability to actually reform a system that um, not just me, but many others started to focus on issues like decriminalizing and decarcerating rather than continually trying to make ourselves feel better by putting some extra programs or extra supports in a fundamentally flawed system, our prison system and our criminal legal system. I think it's interesting that um, that Commissioner, uh, or just sorry, Justice Cameron is going to be focusing a bit on the F word and uh, I think of Foucault and the, the role. Foucault died the year I graduated from law school. And it strikes me that the work that he was doing and the analysis he was bringing to these issues is no is even more important today than it was when I was finishing law school and when I was launching into this area. And I think there's a lot of work to be done but there is, I am so heartened by the incredible energy. Just the, last week I was, was it last week or? Yes, last week I was um, privileged to speak to Professor Park's class and the incredible energy and ideas that people like uh, students like Jen Mackey and others are contributing and the leadership that we're looking forward to going forward really excites me. And so I will, uh, you know, I, I, I don't need to actually say anything more. I'm really, really excited about um, what this series is, uh, is doing generally, but in particular, what this session today will contribute to our discussion. So thank you so much for inviting me. It's a privilege, it's a humbling honor, and I uh, look forward to all of the contributions and to uh, continuing to learn from each and every one of you. Thank you. Thank you so much, uh, Senator Pate, and, and thank you for, for taking the time to be with us today, but also for your uh, incredible body of work and leadership in this area. And so I, I'd now like to uh, pass the floor to our featured speaker, Justice Edwin Cameron, who will share his uh, remarks with us today. Good morning, everyone. Uh, I'm thrilled to be part of this event for, of UBC Connects, and I'm particularly thrilled to be part of the 75th anniversary celebration of the Allard Law School. I had the privilege of being at the law school two and a half years ago to give a lecture, and my only regret is that I'm not there again to be with you and to meet uh, Vice Chancellor and uh, Professor Ono and to meet Senator Kate, uh, Senator Pate. And I really am very privileged indeed and honoured to be giving this lecture. Uh, I want to thank uh, Senator Pate particularly for her enormously astute and knowledgeable remarks. Uh, I was struggling to get her analysis of the report by one of my colleagues uh, at the time before she left for international work, uh, Justice Louise Arbour, her 1996 report, which has been mentioned. Uh, for which Senator Pate provided the driving force uh, and I wasn't able to get it, but I look forward to learning much more about the work that is being done in Canada, as uh, Senator Pate has already said, not just to cast wasted energies into fixing a, a broken system, but into finding different solutions. So on that note, let me tell you what I'm going to do. And then I'm going to do it. I'm going to start off with a bit of background uh, on the Constitutional Court's architecture. 
And then I'm going to start off with a bit of background on South Africa's penal history. Both of those will be very short. My promise to you this morning is that my entire presentation will be well within the 40 minute time given to me. I personally believe that the maximum uh, concentration span for most human minds, perhaps not some of you, is about 35 minutes. So I'm going to try to be finished uh, by around about 20 past. Then I'm going to take three themes from Foucault, and I'm going to look at the panopticon. I'm going to look at his notion of prisons as factories of crime. And lastly, I'm going to come to the wondrous movement that is abroad today the question of abolition and I'm going to look at what I call the paradox of the radical imagination and then I'm going to end on an enormously personal note uh, I was very pleased that Senator Pate mentioned the year in which uh, Foucault died I'm very glad that she mentioned that that was the year in which she graduated from law school because it brings the kind of personal touch that validates and legitimates what I want to say right at the end about Foucault's death from AIDS. And I speak there uh, as someone living with HIV who has survived for the last uh, 22 years on antiretroviral therapy. This very month, 22 years ago, I started on antiretroviral therapy. And uh, while marking privilege in many ways in this lecture this evening, I mark the fact that still many people on my continent do not have the privilege of proper access and availability, but that has been a, a, perhaps the greatest privilege of my life. So let me say that the last 11 years of my judicial life were spent in a wonderfully beautiful building, a light building. It was built in the belly of an apartheid pass law prison. The pass laws were amongst the most shameful, uh, um, dominating subordinating legal implements of apartheid. But it was decided to build this lovely, light, airy, accessible building with the bricks of the old past law. So as one sits in the Constitutional Court chamber determining what our Bill of Rights, many of whose provisions and many of whose forms uh, were influenced by the Canadian Charter of Rights, one is surrounded by the old red bricks of an apartheid past law. They tell us two things, both poignant. The first is the high resolve of our new era in South Africa of democratic constitution, wrapped in aspiration and powered by idealism that we will not repeat the past. The second is a very hard reality, one that contradicts the first, that our prisons in South Africa, this resonates with what Senator Pate has said, far from breaking with the past, continue to embody apartheid-era carceral practices. And in this, the court's location is an acute reminder of the new era's deficits, both of conception and of implementation. Professor Benedetti, I'm going to skip most of the next section. I will simply say that prisons came to South Africa not immediately with the white colonists of 1652, but in the century after where like their colonial uh, forebears in uh, Europe, they adopted moderated punishments. They uh, abolished some of the cruelest physical punishments and instead came up with this great idea, quote unquote, of prisons that we are still stuck with today. And then a third reforming moment, a wonderfully reforming moment came when one of the world's rightly most famous and most inspirational human beings, Nelson Mandela, himself had been a prisoner for 27 years. He became the symbol and the president and the ceremonial and the executive head of our new democracy. And our new democracy turned its back on the carceral policies of the past. It enacted a new Correctional Services Act in 1998, which articulated our new Mandela era style vision for prisons, non-punitive, rehabilitative, correctional. That premise 
has never been realized. The culture of mass incarceration has led to overcrowded, inhumane, and degrading conditions of detention, which pose a danger both to those incarcerated and to prison officials whom we require to guard them. Troublingly, the role, the, the prisons that I, the problems that I confront today as inspecting judge of prisons are the same that my predecessor confronted 20 years ago when he assumed office. These have all become embedded as permanent features of our carceral system, as my fellow South Africans understandably, heaven knows understandably, are preoccupied to an enthralling and horrified extent with the violent crime in our country. As prisoners, as prisoners' rights activists counter calls for even harsher sentencing and calls even to reinstate the death penalty, we have to urge that tougher sentences are misdirected and that the conditions in our prisons do fall foul of our high constitutional aspirations. But and this was the trigger for my lecture. Our debates have not questioned incarceration as an institution, nor have they reconsidered its role in a constitutional democracy. That's why I found Senator Pate's uh, opening remarks so astute. Foucault was concerned with our complacency in social situations. Why do we con accept current structures so blithely? My theme first. First of three themes, the panopticon. Foucault identified systematic subordinative examination and surveillance as fundamental features of disciplinary institutions, including most especially prisons. The exercise of discipline presupposes a mechanism that coerces by means of observation. In the original French, Discipline and Punish, his most famous book on prisons, is Surveiller et Punir to watch over and to punish. He explained that prison, in this by no means unique, entails a rigorous regulation of space. And in this, our societies practice what Foucault called a political economy of the body. Even if they've moved away from the use of violent and bloody punishment, when they use lenient quote unquote methods involving confinement or correction, it is still always the body that is at issue, the body and its forces, their utility and their docility. This is perhaps the best way to manage prisoners, to make them the potential targets of authority's gaze. He contended that the examination combines the techniques of an observing hierarchy and those of a normalizing judgment. In a ritualized examination, remember that, if I may ask uh, you to remember that I'm coming back to that in a mea culpa. At the heart of the procedures, it manifests the subjugation of those who are perceived as objects and the object, objectification of those who are subjected. He saw the formula for this in Jeremy Bentham's 1785 notion of a panopticon, where from a central point, every prisoner can be observed. But of course, Bentham also uh, understood that to entail observation of the observer too, which is something that Foucault doesn't always concentrate on. This Foucault explains, in addition to the internalization of the watching presence, separates each prisoner from the other physically and enables the creation of an elaborate documentary record of every prisoner's conduct. That's my first theme, and I'll make four observations about his notion of the panopticon as embodying the essential operational dynamic of a prison. First, the subordinative scrutiny of the prison system entails a total loss, not only of privacy, not only of autonomy, but of privacy. Incarceration itself in depriving the inmate radically of privacy and of almost any opportunity for seclusion puts on display the body to other inmates, to personnel, but also to visitors like inspecting judges. Second, my second observation is that prisons inspectorates like the one I now head, though not designed to do so, in fact, replicate, reenact, and exacerbate the stabilitating, intrusive, authoritative gaze that Foucault described. The very act of inspecting and monitoring requires that prisoners are put on display. In May this year, I conducted an official inspection 
of Johannesburg's main prison, notoriously and with bitter irony, dubbed Sun City after a fabled luxury resort some 80 kilometers away. As I stopped and talked to prisoners, asking their names, inquiring after their well-being, going into their cells, inspecting their bedding, while notes were kept of everything I saw, it struck me how subordinated to my gaze the prisoners I spoke to were. One of the officials accompanying me described my visit as ceremonial. That's where I asked you to remember what Foucault says about the highly ritualized examination that the prison subordination entails. The ceremony of inspection ritualized and formalized the gaze that Foucault described. To ensure respect for constitutional rights, we examine every aspect of an incarcerated person's lives, their bodies and well-being, their beds, their toilets, ablutions, reading pictures, the words they've inscribed on their walls. We study their daily routine. In this, the inspector's gaze unavoidably becomes an extension of the prison's surveillance apparatus. So the inspectorate legitimizes the carceral project as part of the surveillance architecture designed to produce the docile bodies that Foucault described, and also by offering in our reports the language of human rights within a system that often violates exactly those rights and is not even statutorily obligated for our obligatory for our recommendations to be enforced. In the absence of binding power, the deployment of human rights discourse contributes to a potentially dissembling appearance without necessarily imposing on reality. The charge is this, we are concerned enough to inspect, but not enough to do what Senator Pate said, which is to change. And this I cannot comfortably deny. So the question Foucault poses remains intolerably acute. Does human rights talk merely obscure the horrors of incarceration and the system that it perpetuates? My third comment in the loss, my, my first comment was the total loss of privacy. My second comment was the legitimation function of a prison inspectorate. My third comment is a comment about deviance. In the loss of both autonomy and privacy, Foucault offers the prison as a metaphor for what society enacts more generally upon those it marks as deviant or as unacceptably diverse. This was Foucault's point. He studied institutions like prisons and psychiatric hospitals, even schools, because there one could observe and describe the practices imposed on society more broadly. Hence, the disciplinary techniques we see in prison are similarly used to discipline deviant sexual practice or identities, subordinative, authoritarian, submission-inducing scrutiny, deprivation of bodily freedom, radical priv privacy invasion, incapacitating exposure and punishment. As the election takes place across the border to the south, and as President Trump has appointed uh, a sixth justice to the court of the United States, the Supreme Court, who has who signed in 2006 a statement calling for the retraction of bodily autonomy for women, one should say, and say it loudly, that this is true also of women in societies where termination of pre pregnancy is not optionally permitted, a debate that is vividly alive tonight in the United States and in Poland. Their bodies we force to serve as sites of reproduction. My fourth and final comment on the Panopticon is about internet surveillance. Foucault antedated the internet. He died, as, as Senator Pater said, tragically, long before the internet, before electronic communication, image recording and transmission became universally intrusive. But he foresaw it. He would have embraced the analogy. Uh, prison, he said, is not unique. It is positioned within the disciplined society, the society of generalized surveillance in which he lived. He asks, quote, what is so astonishing about the fact that our prisons resemble our factories, schools, military bases, and hospital, hospitals, all of which in turn resemble prisons, that this surveillance could become as electronically all-pervasive, intrusive, insinuating, inescapable, unobliterable as it has today, 
created a, mon a monster dimensionally more intrusive than Foucault could ever have imagined. My second theme is Foucault's claim that prisons are factories of crime. He was scathingly skeptical of the claim that prison originated in the wish to introduce a humane alternative to the horrors of, of 18th century punishment. While the emergence of prison at the end of 18th century embodied the strange idea that one had to respond to crime by something other than death, torture, or exile, what was put in place instead was some kind of constraining labor to which the individual would be compelled. Prisons thus signified the emergence of an, an entire technique of surveillance and control. Worse, he said, a prison was a factory for producing criminals. This production is not a mark of its failure, but of its success. It makes reoffending possible. It ensures the professionalization of the criminal. It manages control over the illegalities by means of the criminal record, the mechanisms of surveillance, the presence of informants amongst criminals. The effects of this system, he said, exclude social reintegration. So the prison is not an instrument to fight legality. Instead, it is what he called the instrument for the reorganization of illegalities. And this was to be discovered in the emergence in the 19th century of the social delinquent. The establishment of the criminal world, Foucault claimed, is correlated to the emergence of prisons in Western society. Prison privileges a small core of people within the masses who become the exclusive licensees of criminal activity. Therefore, he described the space of the prison as a fearsome exception to the right and to the law, a place of physical and sexual violence, a place of ceaseless and necessarily illegal traffic amongst the inmates, between the inmates and the guards, the guards and the outside world, a traffic which is besides absolutely vital in enabling inmates to survive, sometimes physically even, and it produces a that allows guards to live through their intolerable situation. Let me say to you today that from my experience of prisons over the past 25 years, as a judge when I visited them, it is hard to dissent from any of these assertions that I've just quoted to you. For Foucault, the act of categorizing prisoners as dangerous or non-dangerous, those deserving incarceration and those not deserving, is a practice of division that is central to the role of the prison. Understanding the prison thus demands a rejection of the illusion that penalty is above all a means of reducing crime. The prison functions as a site that reproduces the dominant economic logic of society. The prison is necessary both to accommodate the accumulation of capital and to manage the effects of capital, namely poverty. Prison does this by breaking up the continuity of accepted law breaking. In effect, it isolates a small group who can be controlled. I offer two observations on this my second theme, the prisoners' factories of crime. Foucault has been accused of crude functionalism, as well of over-instrumentalizing class relations and class interests, even of structural determinism. <coughs> Jürgen Habermas charged him with crypto-normativity, which I like the most. I think these charges all have some warrant. In other words, <clears throat> in short, on this Vancouver morning, I don't buy Foucault's structural analysis in its entirety by any means, although his incidental observations have irrevocable power. <clears throat> his insights on the practical role prisons play by accumulating and congregating the bodies of large numbers of adult, mostly men, in protracted conditions of confinement in reproducing skills and aptitudes and dispositions for an entrapment cycle of renewed criminal infraction are, in my experience, searingly incontestable. My second observation is that Foucault's insights on the ideological role prisons play by defining and separating and subordinating a criminal class in reinforcing the position and power of ruling elites are, I think, equally incontestable. Let's look 
the war on drugs, perhaps the most calamitous public policy mistake of the last hundred years, offers an acute and poignant example. The same applies more recently in South Africa. At the start of the COVID epidemic, the quest to, con to contain contagion through lockdown was sought to be enforced through harsh criminal law measures. When social welfare is replaced with a penal state founded on the incarceration of undesirables, prison may be used as a catch-all solution for social problems. Our president, Cyril Ramaphosa, a person whom I personally admire and with whom I worked in my days as a trade union lawyer in the 1980s, rightfully and beneficially ordered the radical advance of the parole dates of 19,000. Thank you so much. My partner's just brought me some very welcome water. Uh, <clears throat> ordered the radical advance of the parole dates of 19,000 inmates who got early release, sharp increase in, but on the, by, by contrast, the new creation of COVID crimes saw a sharp increase in remand populations. We were told by over 10% when I visited the prison in May. When addressing a global health pandemic, which plainly demanded social welfare and public health interventions, government resorted to punishment and retribution, retribution, the knowledge produced by prison and its related discourse. I come to my final theme, third and final theme, and then after that third and final theme, my intensely personal conclusion. The third theme is alternatives to prison, the paradox of the radical imagination. Foucault was skeptical of prison reform and humanization. And that's why, again why I'm grateful to Senator Pate's extremely astute uh, comments. Excuse me for a moment. He scornfully remarked the following. Whether prisoners get an extra chocolate bar on Christmas or are let out to make their Easter duty is not the real political issue. What we have to denounce is not so much the human side of life in prison, but rather their real social function. That is to serve as the instrument that creates a criminal milieu that the ruling classes can control. I've already expressed my, my skepticism about the over-instrumentalization of class and function that, that that represents. The point I make now in this third section is that Foucault was conspicuously sparse with what he would propose in practical terms as substitutes for prison. His famous Montreal lecture, 1977, six years before he died, when Senator Pape was entering uh, law school, illustrates this. He is scathing about prison reform projects. He mentions them, Sweden, Belgium, Germany. He denounces them in searing specificities, yet his own response lacks all practical detail. Instead, he takes recourse to unhelpful generalities. Listen to this. The question of the role and possible disappearance of the prison can only be posed in terms of an economy and a politics. That is a political economy of illegality. Well, thank you, Foucault. The paradox of the radical imagination. He also posits that there can be no reform of the prison without the search for a new society. Sure, but how? His statement is enigmatic but unhelpful. It plunges us into that paradox. We see a social evil, we perceive its, its obstructions, its damages, its counterproductivities, but can we address it only through radical assault on the very structures of society? And if so, is our social program concerned, doomed to remain inchoate until we attain the radical change that we rightfully seek? The same idealism Foucault expressed finds expression in the word work of that redoubtable prison abolitionist, Angela Davis. She contends that we need to reimagine security, which will involve the abolition of policing and imprisonment as we know them. We will, we will demilitarize the police, disarm the police, abolish the institution of the police as we know it, and abolish imprisonment as the dominant mode of punishment. The same urgent call to rethink the securitization of social tensions is reflected in a recent call by three Canadian carceral activists who urge us to seek alternatives to imprisonments and to set our sights on towards prison abolition. Martha Painter, Linda Mussel, 
and Natalia Hunter Jung. I want to name their names. They explain that abolition is a project that replaces punishment uh, um, as considered an effective in reducing violence and instead transformative approaches prioritize health and well-being. Decarceration, by contrast, is the effort to limit the numbers of people who are detained behind bars. Like Davis, these activists locate their critique of prisons within a broader critique of racism and imperialism. They conclude that abolition may sound like a radical new idea, but people have been working towards it for decades. We can defund the police and prisons instead of ticketing people for being outside, snitching on their neighbors, tearing down tents, criminalizing people in mental health and addictions crisis, and profiling black and indigenous peoples. They conclude prisons are too broken to, to reform. If Canada is serious about dealing with racism, then the abolition of both policing and prison prisons is the way forward. Does this leave us stuck in the paradox of radical vision? And my answer is no. It's the same question, interestingly, I was thinking this afternoon, that the abolition of human, the ab abolitionists of human enslavement considered the, the uh, op opposition to white supremacism and its younger brother segregation considered, and uh, that all major abolition movements have sought. And the answer is no, we don't remain stuck in a, in a paradox of radical vision of being disempowered by the very force of our moral vision. First, Foucault's theories are important as a bold project of the mind, of the imagination. They pr provide a deeply necessary counter-narrative, one that destabilizes the idea of prison as a natural and permanent institution. They disrupt the comfort in which we sit, the theory and the practice of penology and incarceration, exposing the horror that prisons are. The American philosopher and social theorist Frederick Jamison 1934, suggests that rather than, than a place, utopia may be employed as an analytical tool to imagine alternative ways in organizing ourselves socially and politically. That is what Foucault does. He enjoins us to ask better questions. His demand for a just future in which prisons become unthinkable presents new possibilities for our thinking, for Canada and for South Africa today. It is true that what we are left with right now after this lecture is a harsh reality and that we are left with only the means at our present disposal to try to change it. Nevertheless, our horizons have changed in ways that are comparable to those that were seen by those who opposed human enslavement and white supremacism and segregation and the subordination of women. Second, Foucault is important not because it is practically feasible for prisons to be closed without more overnight, but because those questions impel us to find better practical answers. Abolitionist thinking has not been only theoretical. Utopian thinking can have a useful hard edge. It has inspired serious and practical grassroots activism. And while it is true that no institution can transcend the political, social, and economic, since we are always bound up by power relations, Foucault recognized that it was within those relations that resistance emerges. Our carceral systems are premised on a supposition that the prison, not the community, is the preferred site of social rehabilitation. By contrast, prison abolition radically denounces this supposition. It frames criminality as a problem of social injustice an organized abandonment rather than delinquency. This gives an added edge to abolitionism. Instead of asking how, in a future without prisons, we will deal with so-called violent people, abolition seeks to provide vital resources to redirect vital resources and systems of the support that many communities already lack. Abolition thus both involves and exceeds the prison and decarceration. It is not a project that merely demands that prison doors be opened. It demands social justice. Hence the cry by the 
Canadian activists that if Canada is serious about confronting systemic racism, we must abolish prisons, as they say. This requires an inspectorate like the one I head then to work within the confines of criminal justice and criminal rights to explore how it can contribute to a society that itself no longer needs the prison, no longer needs discourses of criminology or indeed inspectorates at all. If that is an over ambitious vision, it is one that I think we need nevertheless. Our job, if done correctly, must aim to eliminate the conditions that make our work and institutions necessary. I want to end on a deeply personal note. Foucault died on the 25th of June, 1984. He was 57. He died of AIDS. I'm 67. I've survived 10 years longer than he after his death because of antiretrovirals. Now, the interesting thing, acknowledgement of the cause of his death until two years later his partner his partner daniel de Ferre, who had earlier founded the aids activist organization aids publicly stated that foucault had died of aids i mention this for two reasons the first is for a functional and instrumental reason at the time of his death foucault was recognized not only in the francophone world but in the Anglophone and other worlds as, quote, perhaps the single most famous intellectual in the world. I ask this very personally and it doesn't have an answer. What difference might it have made if Foucault's diagnosis and his, the cause of his death had not been shrouded in obfuscation, obfuscation? Nine months after Foucault died, In March 19, uh, 80, 1985, I became infected with HIV myself. It seems fair to ask whether activist interventions to promote safer sex amongst young men of, like me at that time in my early 30s, having sex with men, might have benefited from knowing that Foucault had AIDS. Instead, it was left to Rock Hudson and Liz Taylor, 15 months after Foucault died, to state before his death, Rock Hudson, on 2 October 1985, that he had AIDS. The announcement created sensation, the same kind of sensation that an announcement by Foucault himself or his family would have created. It made a materially functional, instrumental intervention on AIDS awareness, on funding, research and treatment. Foucault had every entitlement to protect his privacy. I spent my entire life as a judge and a lawyer fighting for the entitlement of choice about privacy and confidentiality. He had the entitlement to shroud the nature of his illness, but the cost of his choice and the opportunities lost when he exercised it are enormous. I mention it for a second reason, more emotional and more conceptual. Foucault himself rarely mentioned shame. Even in his history of sexuality, the word hardly arises, but shame in the sense that Jean-Paul Sartre and Simone de Beauvoir described, namely a relation to oneself in the presence of another in which one evaluates oneself negatively through the look of another. Shame seems persistently indispensable to understand almost everything about Foucault, power, knowledge, sex, sexuality, and prisons. Is there a missing component in Foucault's searingly brilliant analyses of power and knowledge? Does it lie in an understanding of how shame might have propelled his own quest to understand those social forces and structures and how materially shame propels the way that we treat those that we incarcerate, those that we regard as sexually deviant and those that we classify as mentally unwell? But how little Foucault understood when a well-recognized source of social stigma, namely infection with a dread fatal sexually transmitted disease afflicted him of the crippling impact of shame upon himself. I leave that poignant, inevitably unanswerable question hanging. Thank you.
Thank you so much, uh, Justice Cameron, for sharing those remarks with us today. And there's there's so much that we can um, we can discuss and and reflect on uh, in that contribution. So I'm I'm just so delighted that you um, took the time to share with us both um, some very thought provoking um, and also some some very personal uh, reflections on these issues. So. I do want to turn now, and, and I, I thank you also as the moderator for leaving us lots of time for the, the questions and discussion that are, are so valuable. Um, and I do want to start before introducing our um, panelists who are joining us just by saying that this is a very important uh, lecture for the 75th anniversary of the law school, and it reflects a, a deep and long-standing commitment on the part of our law school to engage with issues of, of uh, prison law and, and penal uh, justice. And we have a, a long track record of, uh, of scholarship and contributions in this area. And, and I did want to note the really, um, uh, the, the really path-breaking uh, contributions of Emeritus Professor Michael Jackson, QC. And I think as we see um, recent reports that are, uh, and investigations that are calling our attention to the over-incarceration of Indigenous people in Canada and treating that as if it's a, a new discovery, it's worth mentioning that uh, Professor Jackson's uh, report, Locking Up Natives in Canada, was published just over 30 years ago in the UBC Law Review. And so um, uh, our law school has really uh, led in, in recognizing these issues. They're not new issues um, at all. We're also very proud to be home to um, the UBC Innocence Project, directed by Tamara Levy, QC, uh, which is working to on a number of, uh, of cases with our students to exonerate those who have been wrongfully convicted, uh, many of whom uh, remain incarcerated. And so in addition to, of course, that work, um, we're delighted to have a number of faculty colleagues doing research and teaching in this area. And so I'd like to welcome two of those colleagues here with us today, Professor Deborah Parks, who is um, a professor at the law school. She's also director of the Center for Feminist Legal Studies and holds the chair uh, in, in Feminist Legal Studies. She's a board member of the West Coast Prison Justice Society uh, and has worked uh, in the area of uh, prison law for, um, uh, for really her entire scholarly career. And she's joined today by associate professor Efrat Arbel, who has also um, uh, published um, uh, important scholarship uh, in this area. Who, her work uh, considers detention both uh, in, the, uh, in the prison system, but also of refugees. And she's been involved in a number of key strategic litigation initiatives in the area um, uh, of prisoners' rights. So I'm going to ask each of them just to take two minutes to uh, describe a little bit of the work that they do. Um, and then we'll turn to the questions. We have a number of questions coming in over Slido and, and I encourage people to submit others. And that will be a chance for our uh, panelists and Justice Cameron uh, to reflect both on the remarks that have already been delivered, but also on uh, the issues that uh, our broader community would like us to consider. So I'll, I'll turn it over first to Professor Parks. Thank you, um, Dean Benedet, uh, Justice Cameron. Um, and it's just a real pleasure to be a part of uh, this event today. Um, I feel actually quite emotional uh, having uh, heard your uh, for, heard your lecture, so I'm, I'm just get, regaining my composure and, and really de delighted to participate. I'm joining you from the unceded ancestral um, lands of the uh, Coast Salish people, uh, so, so specifically the Kakite First Nation in what is known as New Westminster, British Columbia. Um, and in uh, I, I mentioned that in part because um, it's in I think incredibly important in the work that I do to um, to teach and research about uh, prisoner rights. And I do that from a prison abolitionist perspective, which I would love to engage with more today in the discussion. Um, 
to, to really uh, foreground the way in which um, prisons operate as um, ongoing sites of colonial violence. And I also bring a gendered um, lens to that, a, a, a feminist lens that is attentive to, or tries to be very attentive to the different ways in which gender um, uh, structures uh, incarceration, uh, our punitive policies, and affects people differently depending on, on their gender. And, and so I look often at women's prisons, but I also look at, at um, at uh, a whole range of, of, of carceral sites. And I look forward to engaging in discussion with, um, with my co-panelists and with uh, members of our audience today. Terrific, uh, thank you, Deborah, and, and I'll just turn it over to uh, Professor Arbel for, uh, for a little introduction of her work. Thank you, Dean Benedict, and thank you, uh, Justice Cameron. It really is a privilege to be here, and thank you for your uh, remarks. Um, my work uh, focuses on Canadian prison law as well as Canadian refugee law, and in my work I examine um, liminal sites, liminal legal sites, sites that are somehow in between, like the prison, but also the detention centre and the border and the various connections between them. And my work at the moment really focuses on, on, uh, on um, number one, analyzing the expansion of the carceral form and the prison system through the expansion of immigration detention and the ongoing incarceration of migrants and refugees, what that means for our understanding of containment and punishment. Um, like my colleague, Professor Parks, my work is also fundamentally concerned with understanding the prison um, as a structure of colonialism and to analyze the ways in which uh, the prison not only perpetuate, but also actively enact colonial violence, um, something that is fundamentally important uh, 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 around the world, but particularly here um, on unceded ancestral territories of the Coast Salish people. Uh, my work analyzes the prison also as a, as a form of territorial dispossession. Um, and finally, I search for the links between um, all those various things. So the ways in which uh, the growth of immigration detention also operates to reinforce the same structures of colonial violence and to try to understand um, the colonial underpinnings, not just of prison law, but also of refugee law and Canadian border policies. Um, it's, it really is an honor to be here and I look forward to the discussion. Thank you so much, um, Professor Arbel, for, for that uh, introduction to your important work. And so I want to turn now to, uh, to questions. And um, uh, we have a number of questions that, um, uh, that uh, viewers and listeners are, um, uh, are sending to us over the Slido tool. And, and people are welcome to, of course, add others. And, our, our first question actually comes from uh, someone that um, uh, that Justice Cameron knows, and, and that's our new colleague, um, Leora Lazarus, who's joined us um, uh, from Oxford, but ultimately originally from South Africa. And so she sends her greetings um, and, and is delighted to see you uh, here. Um, and so uh, she's also um, uh, adding to our uh, our real strength in this field, and we're delighted to have her uh, uh, joining us at, uh, at the Allard School of Law. And so she wanted to ask for, for your reflections, uh, Justice Cameron, but, but also for the panelists on um, uh, this question of legitimation, legitimation. She's asked, is there not a chance that your role as a judge and then your role as a prison inspector operate at that same level of legitimation? Or put another way, do prisoners' constitutional rights and, and rights claims legitimize the panopticon? And so that's her question for, um, for us to consider. And maybe I'll start with Justice Cameron, and then if our uh, panelists want to chime in, they can do so as well. I'll, I'll be short. I'm absolutely delighted uh, for Professor Leora Lazarus to have joined UBC. Uh, I knew when it was in the pipeline being considered and, and what a wonderful move it is for the law school and for her and her partner. The answer is yes. 
But it's the same question that we dealt with under apartheid, uh, Leora. Uh, are functioning as anti-apartheid lawyers legitimated the apartheid legal system? It gave it its dressing. It gave it the capacity to say we're not as bad as you say. So you have to make not a conceptual, partly a conceptual moral judgment, but you've got to make an instrumental value judgment. Am I contributing more through my work for conscientious and religious objectors through people fighting? And it's the same question for me as prisons inspector. Am I, uh, am I a, a dressing on the top? Which, uh, and it, it's, it's a deeper question that you rightly ask, Leora, does the Bill of Rights and the wonderful constitution that we have in South Africa is it like the apartheid legal system functioning as a legitimation for a predatory elite after the Zuma years, the nine years of, of wholesale uh, presidentially led or instigated looting? Uh, does the Bill of Rights function? And, and you've, you've got to ask that. The, the, the question that, that liberal judges under apartheid were asked, shouldn't you resign? Uh, is is a question that that that, that we also had to ask. Uh, is is the Bill of Rights and and the beautiful language of it uh, a legitimation for, for 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 gross structural injustice? So it's the it's a question. I it sounds self indulgent to say that I go to bed with every night, but it's a question that haunts me a lot. But I'd love to hear what Deborah and Efrat ask uh, consider about that. Efrat, forgive me. Well, well, I, I uh, don't yeah. mind jumping in if that's okay. Hmm. Um, yeah, um, the, it's it's a terrific question, and we're so delighted to have Leora on our faculty, and um, and and we need to be asking these questions, and um, and and certainly in in my both in my teaching and my research, this is something that I think a lot about, and um, certainly prison law and. Um, prison lawyering, so advocating for the rights of prisoners, um, is not something that many lawyers actually do <laughs> um, in this country. It's also not something that we spend a lot of time on in law schools. Or, And I think as uh, Professor or uh, Dean Benedet mentioned, uh, UBC has been doing that to some extent. But I think um, what is what I try to reflect on myself is the, the way in which we in the legal uh, legal profession, legal academy, uh, all of us are implicated in the um, ongoing, um, what is going on in our prisons. And we often don't even know what that is. And so that's why I think institutions like prison inspections are really important. And in Canada, we have not um, ratified the optional protocol to the Convention Against Torture. So in fact, we don't have inspections of our prisons and we don't have a commitment to knowing what is going on inside those places. And I think that's a, a fundamental commitment that uh, that we ought to make. But but more generally around thinking about um, how do you maintain a fundamental critique of the um, institutions that you are <laughs> so embedded in and you, the tools that you're using. And I think to, for me any, anyway, and I think it's different for different people, is, is trying to be very grounded in community and in organizing and in social movements. Um, and, and so, and, and accountable to those um, those who are doing work outside, of, like in, in, none of us are outside of the law, but not as sort of deeply um, connected to using legal tools. And and I've I've tried to puzzle this through in some work I've written around uh, prison abolitionist lawyering ethic, and how we can bring that kind of ethic to our work around prisoner rights. And that's seeing abolition as a horizon, as a check against every measure that we're advocating for or. Um, arguing for, is this something that entrenches systems of punishment and incarceration that I, that I have been convinced now over my, you know, research and, and, and work I've done over the years are not achieving the goals that we uh, set for them? Am I entrenching those logics, those carceral logics, or am I resisting them? And is there a way to to do that. And obviously it becomes even more challenging when you have a client, you know, and I'm, I'm not someone who, who is doing that work, um, but you, you, it, it's something that I, I, I'm in dialogue with prison lawyers about, but I, I, I'm interested also in, in other thoughts on that. Professor Arbel, did you want to try? Sure, yes. Uh, Professor Parks, your last point I think really captures it. It's the tension between um, 
understanding the daily lived experience of the human beings who are in these places um, and balancing the commitment to making those lives better and making that violence less uh, with understanding the broader ramifications of being fundamentally implicated in and part of this system. Um, and it, it's, it, as you said, uh, Justice Cameron, it is, it's a haunting question because by virtue of the work that we do, we do legitimate. By virtue of the work that we do, we are part of this structure and not just part of it, but, uh, you know, uh, um, part of the broader colonial structures and, and legal structures that, that, that allow for it to continue. Um, like my, my, my colleagues, I, I share this notion of this idea of abolition as a horizon. Um, and I think just as Cameron, you noted this in your remarks of not losing sight of the, kind of the, the radical objective, the objective of, of, of radical, um, radical change as being an end goal but at the same time, not losing sight of the, the human bodies who are um, suffering every minute of every day as a result of being confined in these spaces, sometimes without legal basis, um, and, and viewing the, the tools that we have with, with a critical lens. So for example, on, on the question of inspection, um, immigration detention is an area of law that not, not only is not subject to regular inspection, but next to no oversight. Um, and that comes with a, with a fundamental cost for the lives of the people who, who are held there. Um, and so it's, it's, a very, it's a very difficult um, balance to strike and um, one that is uh, haunting in its nature. And I think it comes to um, individual uh, responsibility and accountability for how, how we are situated within the system and how um, uh, owning up to the responsibilities that we carry as we navigate ourselves through it. Thank you for those um, for those reflections, and it um, it struck me, um, uh, Justice Cameron, in your remarks that that um, uh, for those of us who are not um, you know working directly in these areas or to, for whom some of these ideas might be a little bit new, that your your comment that um, uh, that the sort of abolitionist paradigm really focuses us on doing the hard thinking about what needs to be done, and that it shouldn't be seen as a kind of utopian project that has no um, uh, that has no practical relevance for what we're doing is a really important insight, um, and it's an insight that that, as you noted and others have noted, applies equally to uh, movements such as police defunding and other kinds of uh, other kinds of seemingly radical um, uh, agendas that really might force us to to rethink um, and to think critically about every choice that we have to make in the moment for the individuals who are um, affected by the systems that are in place. So that's, um, I think, a really helpful uh, observation. I want to turn now to some of the questions that we're getting from um, uh, from those who've been attending this uh, event. And um, the the most popular question is one that I know certainly Senator Pate has told me that that she um, often gets, and I think it's something that's on people's minds when we talk about this. And and it's the question about how um, if we're to move away from prisons, to move away from policing how we address um, uh, violence or uh, risks to community safety that remain uh, even when we uh, attempt to mitigate those with proper social services and programming and funding. And, and I know that question is probably not new to any of you um, uh, because it, it, it's one that concerns um, uh, people who are coming to these ideas uh, possibly for the first time. So. I'll turn that question over to um, the panel. And um, uh, Justice Cameron, I don't know if you have any reflections you might like to offer on that uh, to start us off. I'd very much love to defer to Deborah and to Efrat. <laughs> Thank you. Well, I, I know for Deborah. First, that... Efrat. <laughs> I, I, I think I a lot about it, but I went first last time, so. <laughs> It's a it's a it's a difficult question in that it, it requires a certain degree of um, of of discomfort of letting go of um, structures that are so embedded in our society that we take them for granted and we take them for granted as the only mechanisms through which 
to um, contain and protect against harm. Um, but I think working within the legal system, one becomes aware of the complexity of the law and how um, really un unlimited legal structures can be in that legal structures can be reimagined um, and reenacted in very sophisticated ways to advance the goals of society without without causing as much harm as the current structures do. And that when we really understand um, the prison as a broader infrastructure, not just the, the site of containment, the site of the prison itself where, where an individual is held, but a, a, a spectrum that be begins with kind of the definition of crime and proceeds to how, uh, 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 you know, policing and, and kind of the, the broader infrastructure by which people are sought out and identified as, um, and then brought into court and ultimately incarcerated. That opens up so much more in terms of how we can reimagine the system itself. I can give an example of immigration detention, and this flows from uh, research that I've just completed with um, uh, Molly Joek, who's a PhD candidate here at UBC, of with the onset of COVID-19, um, a new understanding of what is possible in immigration detention all of a sudden emerged. Um, immigration detention had been regulated in, in, in this one particular way um, where um, in the course of detention review hearings, um, the members who review those hearings did not consider uh, conditions of detention as a ground on which to um, order release. That was just how the law had been structured. Um, with the onset of COVID-19, um, th there was a sudden and dramatic shift in the way in which uh, board members uh, considered detention review. And we saw um, this shift resulting in a recognition of the fundamental risk faced by detainees in detention centers, the risk of contracting COVID-19. So this understanding of risk is, is malleable, it, it can shift. And with an understanding of COVID-19 being a risk factor, we saw decision makers releasing immigrant detainees at much higher rates than ever before. And with the cooperation of counsel, with the cooperation of the minister, arriving at solutions by which immigrant detainees can be held in community uh, and still be, you know, be subject to the jurisdiction of the state, but not in a punitive, uh, not confined in a punitive way um, and not subject to as heightened level of risk as COVID-19. So I, I, I use that as an example of, of this one kind of very unique moment in time in which it, in really a matter of weeks, the entire infrastructure shifted um, and shifted in a way um, that it fundamentally protects the same the same goals that the, that the infrastructure was designed to protect that does not cause an enhanced risk to community or society and nevertheless uh, moves away from this kind of punitive uh, form of incarceration. I'm happy to just add a few uh, additional thoughts and um, and this is a question that is uh, you know terrifically important to engage with and I'm really glad that it's being asked um, and I think about a lot. Um, so as someone who um, identifies as a feminist, uh, I care very much about issues of um, addressing violence, particularly a gender-based violence, violence against women, um, trans people, uh, gender non-conforming people, and, and violence against men and children and it, it all, all forms of violence in our community. Um, it is, a, one way of answering that question is to say, how is what we're doing working for us right now? How is our reliance on um, prison as fundamentally a violent response? It's, you know, caging people, um, depriving them, um, you know, all of the stuff that Justice Cameron was talking about around the, 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 the specter of punishment and creation of, of uh, factories of crime. How is that working for us? Um, not very well when we look at issues, for example, of sexual violence, um, uh, you know, vastly underreported, um, vastly under, um, you know, um, under prosecuted, uh, you know, um, convictions not not um, 
not um, resulting in most cases. So it's only a very small number of people who are actually going to prison for the, the very uh, huge problem of sexual violence in our in our societies. And so what if we were to use the resources that we spend in policing, prosecuting, incarcerating um, to actually fundamentally address issues of of uh, violence in our communities. Um, that it, it costs, for example, um, almost $300,000 a year to incarcerate a woman in a federal prison. It costs over 150,000 to incarcerate a man. These are incredible resources we are spending. Um, and that doesn't get at all the other policing and, and probation and, and, and other areas of surveillance. And so, Yes, we need um, we need safety in our communities, but we need to reimagine and look at there are models um, of of um, communities working um, to keep people safe in and uh, through various forms of accountability, support that people need, um, addressing you know it's it's that old, I mean it's the old answer of addressing fundamentally root causes, right? And what we what we call crime is really the result in so many cases of trauma, poverty ongoing imp impacts of colonization, racism, you know, um, deprivation, uh, our child welfare systems as funnels to, um, to prison. There's so much that we, it, it's, it's a, a complex problems do not have easy solutions. Locking people up is an easy at a rhetorical level and at a conceptual level solution. But when you dig down, you see it, it fundamentally doesn't work. And there's great, um, opportunity in this moment as people are starting to realize that with movements like Black Lives Matter and defunding uh, police and and people uh, sort of realizing when they take a hard look at it, what are we actually achieving with what we're doing? So, I mean, much more I could say, but I want to leave room for others. So we also have a question here. Um, a number of people are, are hoping that the panel can reflect a little bit on the role of defense counsel and on um, uh, proper funding for defense counsel. So the question is um, uh, that public defenders don't, don't have the resources that are necessary to really um, vindicate the rights of their clients to a fair trial. Um, and what might some solutions be for that? And how does that play into the conversation that we are having? So I know that's kind of a precursor to um, uh, to prison, but but some thoughts anyone might like to share on uh, the role of defense counsel um, and um, what what role that plays into into who ends up being incarcerated and and for how long. Yeah, Fred, Deborah, I'm going to def defer again, but I wanted to, something is going on in my head about women in prison, and I, I want to, at the end of your responses to that important question, I want to say something which, which, uh, which I hope will be provocative, or sound provocative. <laughs> Terrific. We, we, uh, we'll we that, but, but yeah, and I'll, um, I'll just turn it back to our, our panelists. Deborah, maybe you, you want to say a few things about yeah, that. Yeah, so, so, so with respect to, yeah, I mean, um, in the system that we have right now where we do um, uh, focus our resources on prosecuting people for crime, and again, and crime is um, what we consider criminal and what we choose to focus on in our surveillance and in our prosecution is only a slice of what um, what is actual crime or what could be considered crime. Um, we don't go after in any meaningful sense um, uh, the pollution and the, um, the corporate crime that actually uh, kills many people um, every day, right? Um, so the in, in individualizing nature of our criminal legal system is to focus on individual, so-called normal crime, as criminologists would say, the, 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 the crime that gets uh, um, identified by our surveillance and our criminalization of certain classes. Um, but uh, with the kind of resources that, that prosecution um, divisions have across the country, um, we don't have equal resources for defense uh, counsel uh, and legal aid rates across the country are not um, uh, in, 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 in many contexts at a level that of anywhere near parity with, um, with um, 
the resources that prosecutors have. Um, we, having said that, we have a terrific um, um, defense bar and also very, um, uh, you know, um, good relationships in many contexts in terms of between Crown and defense. And, and there's lots more we could say about how that all works. But the area that I think is most lacking in terms of um, public funding for, um, for, uh, for legal aid for incarcerated people is in prison law. There, uh, most provinces in this country do not have any legal aid funding for prison law at all. So people who are um, placed in segregation, solitary confinement, who are involuntarily transferred, who are subject to violence, um, abuse, death, um, do not have access to um, legal aid to bring the, the, the meaningful impact of our Canadian Charter of Rights and Freedoms uh, in a parallel um, situation to, I think, the situation in South Africa with a very uh, wonderful document with um, guaranteed rights to equality, liberty, security of the person, um, uh, habeas corpus. All of these things um, are, are only um, enforced uh, when there are resources to do so. And so here in British Columbia, we're fortunate and um, Dean Benedict mentioned that I sit on the board of the West Coast Prison Justice Society, which is um, really the only um, uh, full service legal clinic of its kind uh, to address the rights of um, uh, incarcerated people. And even we in, in the country, and even that organization does not have the resources. We turn away, people are turned away every single day, all day um, who call with very serious issues of um, charter and other legal violations. So um, uh, if we're going to be using incarceration in the way that we do, um, and I would like us to think you know, critically about that, but um, while we are, uh, I think it's imperative that we um, speak loudly and, um, and, and require that, um, that that rule of law be uh, enforced um, in, those, in those prisons law, prison walls, which is something that, um, you know, Michael Jackson, um, who taught me prison law um, more than 20 years ago uh, here at UBC, has been saying for uh, for decades now. So I'm going to go back to Justice Cameron because I'm watching our time here and, and I want to hear his provocative comment <laughs> about women and incarceration and make sure that I shouldn't have called it uh, provocative. It, it was something that occurred very late in my preparing for this uh, lecture, uh, Dean. I, I asked about the proportion of women in South African prisons, and it's about 2%. And I asked about parole for them. And then something emerged, which quite shocked me. It's a very senior and trusted official of mine who knows these things. He said that many women in South African prisons prefer not to benefit from parole, because it might entail their returning to the male-dominated precarities from which they came. For them, prisons may offer a temporary, albeit grossly inappropriate, respite to the risk of intimate partner violence. In other words, prisons may at time, times unofficially address our failure, your and mine, as societies to manage gender-based violence produced by social precarity of women. But it also might help those same vulnerable groups to find a measure of security. We have um, here here in Canada certainly with uh, when you look at um, our, our numbers of women incarcerated are actually considerably higher than than two percent um, uh, between five and ten percent depending on which prison system provincial um, or uh, federal that you're looking at um, but those numbers of have been increasing um, and as Kim um, Senator Pate mentioned um, Indigenous women are. 44% of the federal uh, prison population. Um, and it's a, it's a, a real, um, I think, statement on the, the way in which we will have resources for a woman to be safe. And I, would, I, I, I do put that in scare quotes because I think prisons are not fundamentally safe institutions. We know a, a report was just um, tabled last, um, last week by the correctional investigator here in Canada about the extent of sexual violence in, um, in prisons in this country. Um, and, um, but, but it's a real indictment of our system if we have $300,000 um, a year to spend on incarcerating a woman in a federal prison and we don't allocate even a portion of those resources to provide her with safe and affordable housing um, and the resources she needs to live um, safely in the community, often with her children, and to keep them safe as well. And it's a real indictment if, if we're looking to prisons to provide that safety. 
Thank you. I, I think we have time for just one more question, and, and I thought um, I, I might um, uh, I might choose this one because it it takes us back to um, some of the the theoretical concepts, uh, Justice Cameron, that you were engaging with in your remarks. And this is from someone who says that they've been reading um, Achille Mbembe. I hope I pronounced that correctly. Uh, mm -hmm. Book Necropolitics, Shield. and and wants to know whether you see prisons and incarceration as not only biopolitical uh, about the body, but also necropolitical. So I thought that was a good, uh, uh, a good question to pose. It's a wonderful uh, uh, necropolitical in the sense of what I think necro means, ne necropolis or, 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 or necro dead. I suppose. I, 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 there isn't an acting <laughs> Um, it, it's uh, a tantalizing question, but I think I'm going to pass on it. <laughs> and I haven't, right, I haven't read enough. that. Uh, Ashilam Bembe is one of our great thinkers. He's a, a South African who's originally from Cameroon, a French, Francos, Francophone African who's uh, an Anglophone Afri South African now. Uh, but I haven't read that. But um, I, I, please tell the questioner that I'm certainly going to be inspired to look that up. Well, there Whether you go. Well, 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 just repeat. Yes. Whether, whether prisons and incarceration are not only biopolitical, but also necropolitical. Um, and so I, I'm assuming as well that that kind of refers to um, uh, a focus on death um, uh, as, yes. uh, as the ultimate, perhaps the ultimate end goal of I the... I wish uh, to have the answer next year. Okay. Um, and... Uh, Question here, which is probably comes as no surprise to anyone, but but uh, a request to just say a couple of things about COVID-19 and prisons. And, and Professor Arbel, this might feed into your question about how quickly it's possible to pivot um, when circumstances change. But also in, in terms of this question, uh, a failure on the part of uh, the Canadian correctional system to release, um, uh, to decarcerate in the face of COVID-19. Um, and so, uh, while there may have been some progress in the area of immigration detention, the, um, uh, the, the criminal justice uh, system may not have been so quick to, to pivot. So I don't know whether, Professor Parks, you um, have anything to talk about. I, I worry I'm taking up more time than my fair share um, here, um, but I will just say that um, that uh, we saw we saw a few different responses from governments in Canada and uh, to COVID-19 and the huge vulnerability of the um, incarcerated population and also the staff who work there and go in and out of those institutions. Um, and uh, in Nova Scotia, in the provincial um, uh, system in Nova Scotia, what we saw was um, a concerted effort by actually Crown, some judges, defense lawyers, and community agencies that work with people who are um, uh, criminalized. And we saw concerted efforts to decarcerate in the moment when, in, in, in March and April, when uh, the real, uh, the pandemic really was, uh, was uh, coming into our institutions, and they were able to to reduce the prison population by more than 40 uh, 40 percent. We have not seen um, uh, the same kind of um, attention at the federal level, and I'll just say that that it's, it's unfortunately been the reductions in population have only come through reduced admissions by trials that weren't happening. Well, that brings us to the end of our our time, and and I think is a good place to end because it shows us that you know um, that often um, uh, these decisions we're making choices about what can and can't be done in in the face of those conditions. So, I just want to thank Justice Cameron, uh, Professor Parks, and Professor Arbel for today's really fascinating discussion, and to thank all of the people who participated by sending their questions into us. And I'm sh I'm sorry that we couldn't get to all of them. They're, they're rich and complex and there's lots to say about each and every one. Uh, the planning team for UBC Connects also appreciates and, and really values your feedback, so you'll be receiving an email in the coming days about the event and how you can make comments and suggestions for future events as well. So I just want to thank everyone for their time this morning and, um, uh, and uh, wish you a, a wonderful day um, uh, and, uh, and, and really just thank you again for joining us for this event.